Awesome. It looks like we're live now. For anyone who was um, at the, oh great, Hannah, hello. For people who were just on the watch party on YouTube for the Global Coffee Festival, thank you so much for joining me and look like so many other people from around the world and it made me really happy to see. Really excited to be able to talk further on here and to be able to be share someone who's super important to me and the work um, I will be joined in just a few minutes with Daniel Vargas. He is the programs coordinator for Café de Monteverde and education programs with Life Monteverde, which you just saw in the film. And very excited to have him join me in just a few moments. I am also wearing earrings from Unity Women's Village. In the film, they were the last component to the film. And um, I think it's important anytime there's a screening. Oh, yeah, you can see the poster behind me too. But anytime there's a screening, I love to wear something from Unity Women's Village. And their, their beadwork is available on theconnectedcup.com that links directly to their Etsy site. And I think it's just a, a wonderful way to encourage the women and, and to help them grow with providing education and food and clean water and tea and coffee, which also very important in life. I am going to, oh, thank you. I'm glad you like the earrings. I am going to add Danielle. So for those who just um, joined, Danielle Vargas, let's see, go live with Cap Day. Here it is. He'll be joining us. And again, Danielle is the programs coordinator for Café de Monteverde. There he is. Oh, and can you hear us all right? Yes, perfect. Oh, great. You're coming in perfect as well. I love the background. So can you tell us where you're at and um, where are you? Uh, at the farm. There's just a little bit of a drizzle here, you know. Oh, I love it. Are you getting wet, though? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Just making sure. So you, um, in the film, we got to see a lot of Café de Monteverde and Life Monteverde and Guillermo talks a lot about community aspect and how Café de Monteverde really is, it's a family, it's a whole community effort. And I'm curious how you guys are doing right now. Has anything changed from, I'm sure there's a lot that has changed, but as, what has changed since Gosh, was that four years ago I was there filming? So four years since we filmed for the yeah. documentary. Almost exactly four years ago. It was around this time of year. So the, the harvest yeah. starting back then. And definitely a lot of changes. Um, a lot has stayed the same. And it's been in the last few months that, you know, with everything that's going on around the world, we've, we've if anything, realized how much important, how much a community is. Um, and I think in, in your case, like what you laid out so beautifully in the film was how community gathers around the cup. In our case, it's the, the farm is the cup, right? The, the farm work, the, the working the earth is, is uh, the gathering for us. And um, the last few months have been all about that, kind of getting back to, to working um, the farm. The rest of the economy has been kind of quiet, you know, um, not a lot of travel for sure. Um, so it's it's been a great time to kind of root again uh, where we are. That's wonderful to hear. Did you uh, did you see any? Have people been commenting about how they're missing coming to the farm or to the cafe, um, and just internationally and everything too? Because I know when I was there, you had a lot of tours coming in every day. So um, is we're missing everybody too. Um, when you were here, one of the shots that I loved and that you included in the documentary was from Children's Day. So every year in September, we celebrate uh, Children's Day and we open up the farm to the community. Where I am, I'm kind of in between coffee rows and we just open up bike trails in between the, the um, coffee paths and kids will just cycle through all day and get muddy and wet. Um, and we miss that kind of energy, right? Um, having the community here. So we're finding other ways to connect. Um, such as your film, ways to connect with people around the world. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I loved uh, a little anecdote that Danielle had told me before was that he got a, um, a message from someone in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I am in Arkansas right now, who saw the film and um, wanted to make place an order or 
you know, there was a, a connection that way. And I love that more um, conversations and connections together. So that made me smile. <laughs> yeah, and I think everybody who's watching to head over to the Connected Cup website. And there's so much information there on all the countries and the projects you visited. Uh, we've been learning a lot, sharing with our staff here uh, what coffee looks like in other parts of the world where there's water scarcity issues or um, maybe other social issues that we're very lucky not to face here. Um, and so it, it's a great resource, the, the page that you built that goes along with the, with the film. Oh, great. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I know that um, we're able to buy, purchase coffee from Cafe de Monteverde. Let's see, I'm getting a little bit of static. Hopefully it's all right. Uh, everyone, hopefully everyone's all right. But um, yeah, being able to purchase coffee from Cafe de Monteverde, I love the meal. Meal is right, the honey processed one. Oh, that is <laughs> yeah. the best. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a coffee that you know you can't just get all year round at, on our end from the farm, right? We have to wait until the the peak of the season. So both the miel and the natural processes. Um, I think you've got some some clips of that in the in the documentary. They're very specific to a time of the harvest when the coffee is very ripe, when we're at the peak. Um, so it's associated to like this kind of image uh, smells uh, from the harvest season. Oh, I love that. Um, so in the film, too, we got to see some of the baby coffee plants that were being planted four years ago at the farm. Can you give me an update on those? Have you been out to... <laughs> My favorite part of the film um you know that was four years ago and we just did that again a couple of months ago um you have to do that while there's still plenty of rain so the the coffee plants will, will thrive um you couldn't do that now because we're about to go into the dry season um and it's just such a, a like a manifestation of of faith if you will because you're hoping those plants will produce in about three years from now and for you know 30 years onwards so you're kind of putting into the ground this, this intention, this, this trust in, in the process and in, in the natural resources, of course. You might not even be around harvest that coffee. Yeah. But like so many people in, in the film were saying, it's all about the next generations that will kind of take over and, and um, kind of reap the benefits of the work that we're doing today. So we do that every year. Um, of course, we have to change the varieties that we use. So this year we're using some newer varieties or kind of better adapted to dry conditions. Oh, interesting. That's neat. I, um, I love whenever Guillermo talks about planting the trees and the different farms and how we're all interconnected. That's one component that I've heard a lot from viewers that have really stuck with them. My, my favorite, um, I think, favorite just takeaway from the film that people will tell me is that they're more um, intuitive or they look for certain things that Guillermo talked about in the film. Is this, this, is this sustainable? Is it helping um, the community in any way? And I think that's really special. So he was able, I'm sorry that he wasn't able to be with us today, but um, I think that you're able to talk a little bit definitely about how, um, how coffee is more than just the, um, the environmental side. It's also socio and um, everything as well. Yeah, and, and what, I, what we loved when we were watching the, the documentary is how as you travel around the world and engage with people around the world, it's really kind of a look into meditation, you know? Um, yeah. We don't have, at least in, in this culture in Costa Rica, the, the tradition around uh, meditation that you have in the East. Um, and definitely we prefer coffee over tea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe we have some things more in common with the culture of the fast espresso in, in Italy that you were showcasing. But it's really every, every aspect, it's, it's a different kind of meditating. Um, for us, a lot of the meditation is, is the farm work, um, the kind of connecting with, with the rain, um, insects, with um, all of the unexpected things that you know you're going to run into throughout the day working in the farm. Um, and it, it was neat to see for others, it's, you know, the act of sitting down, the, the warm drink. Um, yeah, I think that's so special. Um, how are the goats doing at the farm? Good, good. Um, I think they're missing the company. Oh. But, um, 
Yeah, it's it's uh, been a privilege to be in a diversified farm. So if, if like around me, there's you know, banana pond, wow. um, coffee, of course, and then over on the other side, um, the forest, right? And so go, coming up to like uh, the economic crisis from COVID-19, it was a time when we like scaled up our food production um, so that we could provide food to the staff. And everybody's kind of working limited hours because there's there's less work, right? Um, but at least we're we're producing more food to provide to our staff and, and the community around. And just um, to have had that diversity coming into this is so rich, you know. Um, I think that's oh, that's really special. I'm glad to hear that. And what a positive takeaway. And I would say really just adaption to what's going on. Um, do you have any plans for the future? Has the education side of things, has that changed a little bit with um, colleges maybe not able to come and visit Life Month of Our Day and see how you're doing full circle at the farm? Tell us a little bit about what's to come with the education side. At least as, as far as we can tell, yeah, into the future. Um, we're looking into ways of providing um, education more virtually. So... Um, doing virtual programs, uh, some virtual tours. We know now is a time when people want to connect to nature. They want the quiet and peace of nature and um, they're revaluing what's important in life. And so kind of if, if there's any way in which we can provide that to people who've been here before or, or didn't even know about us before, um, we're here for that, right? To provide. We know a virtual experience is never going to be the same, but you know, it, your documentary is an example of how, you know, an image from all the way around the world can inspire us. Um, and I can say that was true for us, kind of looking into the stories from um, Assam Baruro, the Unity Women's Group. Yeah. Also, many people in, in, in our staff. Um, and so that's one piece, kind of virtual education. Um, also selling online and, and um, selling online, not just to sell, but as a way of connecting with coffee straight from a source. It's uh, not very common to uh, roast at origin. Mm -hmm. And Rica, you know, it's uh, all the people who are following here from Costa Rica don't know, you know, we've exported for so long our best coffee, right? And um, maybe had it developed our own coffee culture, right? And one amazing shift in the last few years is we're, we're keeping our, our coffee, our, our specialty beans here, right? And yeah. <laughs> getting a sense for the nuance of coffee from our own country, right? Um, and a better understanding of the rest of the process, not just farming, but roasting, cupping, um, the world around coffee shops too. Um, and so that's, that's been really exciting to be able to export uh, coffee right from a roastery, which is I, I'm <laughs> away from it, uh, all the way around the world. Um, that is incredible. I love hearing that. I didn't know um, that Costa Rica had kept, had exported their the best coffee for so many years. And so I do like that you're able to keep specialty coffees and really be able to enjoy it in the process. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Just this year, we're celebrating that 200 years since the first export of coffee to, to England. Wow. Um, a lot a long part of that, yes, we were exporting uh, the higher quality coffee abroad, right? Where you can get better prices for your coffee. Um, but there's been kind of an awakening now of kind of a taking ownership and getting to know the, our own crop. Um, at the same time, it's not just about exporting, but learning from experiences around the world. Like we were first exporting to England, but you know, we also got from England this model of cooperativism which was so, as, as you saw in the video, around the social democracy that coffee creates because we learned from a very, like very early on that to make this succeed, you have to work together. You know, like most coffee farms in Costa Rica uh, are less than five hectares. Um, mm. And so you have to pull your crop together to make it work in the end, right? To mill your coffee and um, kind of make the process efficient. And so, and, and that's an, um, a model of cooperatives and some of the first models came from, from England. So it's been kind of a, a sharing, right? Yeah. 
That's really interesting. Um, the co-op side of it too, because I mean, Cafe de Monteverde was, um, or correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it started by family. I mean, it was, um, right. You want to talk a little bit about that? Cause uh, I'm sure I'll butcher it. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's, it, it started out with, with three friends and siblings. Um, and since then, it's grown, and now we're uh, 15 families that are part of this organization. Um, and we start out with a cooperative in Monteverde, Café de Monteverde, and um, a Fair Trade certified, because that's a requirement to be Fair Trade certified. Um, we, we have become independent since then. One of the shifts in, in the area has been, as there's more tourism, there's a shift away from agriculture. And so that took away some of the strengths from the cooperative movement but we've kept the same value. So we still work with farmers in the area to mill their coffee and make sure that, you know, if they do um, a lot of work on quality, they can get good prices for their coffee, invest in making their, their operation more sustainable, doing more sustainable practices, which uh, are more expensive. Yeah. Um, so even though we're not formally a cooperative anymore, um, the model persists, the, the values persist. And it's still true in Costa Rica. Most of the coffee farmers in Costa Rica are part of cooperatives. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. I think, um, oh, I love it too, Andrew. Ah, uh, the sense of community, absolutely. The most important ingredient. <laughs> I like that. I'm trying to see if people had um, questions. Let's see. I want to make sure we're able to answer any questions. Um, yes, the earrings. Um, for someone had asked about the earrings, they are from w Unity Women's Village in the film in San Bru, and you can buy them on theconnectedcup.com through Etsy, which uh, definitely is able to help with clean water and education, but also to get coffee and tea. So don't forget that. <laughs> Um, Danielle, how can people get a hold of you if they want to, well, once things clear up a little bit more and, and travel is uh, a little more responsible and able and possible, how can they get a hold of you to maybe come visit Café de Monteverde, the farm, or to order coffee from you? What's the best way to do that? Um, one way is here, <laughs> through, through Instagram. Uh, we're, we're learning about all of these new... Um, technologies and, and ways to connect. It's been one, one great thing about um, this new era that we're in. Um, definitely weren't as, as tuned in <laughs> to the digital world before, but through Instagram, through our website, uh, Cafe de Monteverde, and there you can learn about um, the coffee, our processes. Um, we also do education programs on the farm. So for uh, the last 10 years, we've worked with school groups and um, university groups, researchers. Uh, one research project that we just closed up was around soil fungi. Really exciting. Um, yeah, and definitely very much related to, to our cup of coffee. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think it. So yeah, our, our website, there's a little bit of information about that, different ways in which you can connect. And we know there's a lot of uncertainty, so we're kind of open um, to that kind of uh, making plans for the future, but knowing that we're not tied to them. And I think your, your film showed that really well. I uh, kind of thanks. Look forward, but letting go at the same time. And I know there's a, a couple questions here. Yeah, uh, for you, I think will be best to answer. Yeah, so um, someone's asking about other coffee farms that we collaborate with. So uh, we work with about 10 um, other farms in the area, all small farmers. And um, once the coffee season picks up, we'll, uh, we'll have a collection point, um, a recibidor, where everybody will bring their coffee at the end of the day. Uh, these are small farmers, you know, on, on average, it's about 30 uh, quintales. Um, that's 30, 30 big bags of coffee, uh, 30 sacks of coffee per, per farmer. Um, and then from there, it will go over to our mill, where we will mill, wash the coffee, and lay it out to dry. Um, and one great thing in Costa Rica is there's a lot of legislation around farmers' rights. So the, the farmers that we work with, they're um, insured a certain price for that coffee. And that coffee belongs to them, like legally, until it's sold in the market, at, way at the end of the, of the harvest season. Um, so that's, that's one, one good thing, the, 
the rights that protect farmers here. Um, there's another question. Um, once a coffee berry is picked, how soon will it be roasted? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, like, for example, right here, this is green coffee. Right? This was a, a flower maybe eight months ago. Um, some of the beans are starting to turn yellow. I don't see any red ones yet. So it will be ripe um, in late December, January. So that's when we'll pick it, when it's ripe. We'll, we'll come through several times. And... Um, it's going to be roasted, you know, almost a year from now. Um, yeah, because you have to let it dry and you have to let it season too once it's dry. Yeah. So everyone's drinking pre-pandemic coffee <laughs> at this point in life. <laughs> and so am I. Yeah. I'm, I'm yep. <laughs> our last season, yes. Oh, that's so cool to see. I love um, in Ethiopia, they had the, had you seen the wild coffee forest before? The, the picking there. It was so interesting because they climbed trees and um, in order to get it, which is dangerous, but the, um, the beans will just, or the, the cherries will just fall, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, and, <laughs> and that place where there's so much diversity, so much more. I got dogs barking. One second, everybody. This is live, so I'll let you keep on talking. Yeah, that, that episode was, was enlightening to us. We, of course, we, we read about it, um, but um, we, we didn't have varieties that big in Costa Rica um, only at the beginning, right? Uh, our, our first um, Arabica varieties that we had were these um, huge varietals. And over the years, farmers have been picking ones that are kind of smaller, more that um, to a farm, you know, kind of. <laughs> these were my yeah. Farm over five feet and so this is what we what we can pick right um that is so cool yeah do can you do a little 360 so everyone can see the farm a little bit oh neat coffee and then is it a little more sp that's for roasting um and back over here then there's um you know all of our coffee lots or parcelas are surrounded by by forest it's a lot of benefits. It's a way of breaking the wind, like pollinators, um, a lot of um, biodiversity in the soil that comes from the forest. Um, yeah. And then yeah. a lot of banana plants. There's uh, an orange tree right over there. <laughs> <laughs> Intercropping a lot with the coffee. Um, you were asking before about the baby plants? Yeah. Yeah. So um, when we plant the, the small coffee, it leaves a lot of sunlight exposed. So right here, there's not a lot of sunlight coming through. But when the coffee is really young, a lot of space, lots of sunlight. And so we will usually plant beans in between and maximize the, the space. You know, you get the, uh, the um, nitrogen fixing from the beans and you get the, you, the coffee plants growing right next to them. I love how it's able to be integrated and it's not just a monocrop. Like Guillermo had said, it's really, truly um, being able to make the, the soil more fertile and to give back to the land. So I, I love that that is a big part of your emphasis on as a um, coffee farm, but also just as a community. Mm. It's wonderful. So I actually wanted, I wanted to ask you, Brooke, what's stuck with you, you know, four years later since you've traveled the world? What are the memories that or sticking with you or uh, things that have made their way into your um, routine, into your uh, way around life now? Yeah, I think I, you know what, I'm glad you said that about the um, meditation side of it uh, earlier in our live when we were talking, because I think that's really stuck with me is being able to take more time with coffee and make a ritual and look for beans that are ethically sourced and find more of a connection to the, the origin of the coffee, but the communities that are involved and where that's going. So there's more transparency, which is one model that I love about Cafe de Monteverde. So I'm hoping I, I try to look for that. You know, it's, I learned it from you when I was there and from the community itself being so transparent. I wanted to make sure I learned more about that as well. So that has always stuck with me. And then, um, so the meditation side, and one aspect that doesn't really go with coffee, but it has totally transformed my life since doing 
the three years of filming and the nine months of editing for the film was taking help <laughs> and allowing for people to help me. And it's not, it's not seen as me taking from them, but it's allowing people to give and to reframe that because we as humans love, to, I mean, it feels good to give. We love to be able to offer advice or whatever it may be. So I think the whole journey itself taught me how to receive. <laughs> I'm still not great at that. I still uh, have trouble allowing people to give me anything, but it is something that has stuck with me. So, Do you think you'll do something like this again? I would love to. I really would. I would love to continue with the Connected Cup. I think there is more that could be a part of it and could stem from what we've you know, created with the, the feature film, but I would love to do more projects. I'm on my, uh, doing my master's in cultural anthropology. So I'm hoping to find more stories where I'm able to travel and um, able to learn more through the anthropology side too. I have another question, if, if I may. Yes. It's something that we as producers can learn from people who are, um, you know, drinking coffee or tea, maybe, you know, in a city environment or somewhere that's a little more detached from, from the farming side of things. Um, so yeah. much of work and kind of life goes into this on the ground, right? But there's, that doesn't mean there, there isn't a lot to learn from, from people in their daily rituals who are interacting with, with our crop at the end, right? Right. I think that being able to educate more, um, the baristas are so integral to talking with everyday people and where knowing where the beans come from. And when I have someone who is making my coffee and I, if I ask a question, I say, oh, have you had the like, Jurgischeff blend before or single origins? And they can say something about the community or know where exactly where it came from or talk more about it. I think that is making the world a little bit smaller in the coffee side of it and allowing for more of that transparency still. So I think um, just like you're doing, the education side of it is so important and people like to know where it's from or like to know that they're being connected to a part of coffee rather than just the, these beans showed up out of nowhere and I drank them, <laughs> right? So um, I hope that we see more of that in the future too. And I think we're learning too from, like, for example, in the Global Coffee Festival that the main ingredient in coffee and tea is water, right? Yes. <laughs> and so the, the kind of the centrality that has to all of us, you know, regardless of what we're doing. Yeah, and especially now with um, COVID and other, unfortunately, other problems in the world that are making clean water even even harder to access or um, so it's important to remember that we're all very privileged to have clean water. Yeah. And the responsibility we have. Um, I, one thing I've learned from Guillermo is, you know, maybe we can't fix the world, but you know, we're responsible for this small um, patch of land here <laughs> and, and whatever small thing we can do towards that end. Um, one of the things we did last week with, with um, our organization is we have this sustainability certification called Bandera Azul. And it's, you know, more than the certification itself. It's about the whole process that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And when we were celebrating, half the, the people there um, were Nicaraguans. Um, a lot of in our, people in our staff are Nicaraguans. And I can go more in, into that uh, here later if there's time. But um, you know, we were talking about, you know, it's not really, it doesn't really matter where you're from or what flag you're raising. It's about, you know, kind of where you are in the world and where you're walking through in life and what you do with that time. And so even if we were here in Costa Rica or in, or in Nicaragua, you know, we would hope to be doing the same thing, right? To be doing what we do responsibly. Um, yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Um, and also I know Hannah is too, I see her saying. Um, she's familiar with the Bandera Azul, so that's really exciting. You're welcome to talk a little bit more about um, that if you'd like. We have about three minutes, so if anyone else wants to ask some questions, I'll allow them to do that in this time. Um, oh, sorry, what'd you say? No, I'm, I'm just reading to see if there's other questions here that we haven't gotten. Yeah. yeah what that COVID has brought up here is um, 
the kind of the interdependence that our country in Costa Rica has, um, definitely on tourism, number one, um, but also in terms in specifically for agriculture with migrant labor from Nicaragua. And in our organization, we've had a um, 30 year partnership with Ometepe. Mm-hmm. For those who know, it's an island in Lake Nicaragua. And there's, so there's a specific community there um, that organizes every year to travel here for coffee picking. Um, and it's been a really neat process, uh, like a partnership over the years um, of, you know, kind of working on, on justice, like labor justice, fair wages and working conditions and the partnerships between the communities. Um, and one, one of the questions that COVID-19 brought up this year is, are we going to be able to do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and for other coffee pickers, it's at a larger scale. Every year, thousands of of uh, migrants will come into Costa Rica on this time of year for the coffee season. And so it becomes a matter of, will I be able to, to harvest my crop? Um, and we will be able to, the, the, the borders are open and there's of course a lot of protocols to make it safe um, for everyone. And we're, we're very glad. And it, it's not really just about the harvest, but, but what it means for those families to be able to travel here and, and earn the income from, from a harvest season. Um, because then that's, that's income that they use back home for their farms, for their education. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you're starting to rain a little bit here. You see, you're probably hearing the uh, drops. A little bit, yeah. Well, that is perfect timing then because um, the rain always appears when it's time to wrap up. <laughs> that is great. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I will, in the comment section afterwards, link for anyone else who um, wants to see more from Cafe de Monteverde. I'm sure you want to. So I will link that there. And then also the film's website, I will link at the bottom in the comments as well. And really happy we were able to have this conversation, not even just because it was so great to catch up with you, but it was so great to be able to have this conversation. And hopefully if it connects or resonates with anyone else who is able to join, they can reach out and make this world a little bit smaller. So. Thank you, and thank you for, for sharing your story with us. Um, definitely a, a piece of work that I'll be coming back to. So. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.